Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. James Knopp. I'm here to talk today about myoglobin, hemoglobin, and oxygen binding. The purpose today is to talk about what's the process of going the oxygen going from the lungs to the tissues. To start with, we have to look at the individual components. The first component is going to be myoglobin. Myoglobin is a single polypeptide chain, which is folded together with a lot of alpha helix present in it. It contains one heme group and one iron group. In it, its X-ray structure was determined in the 50s and 60s by John Kendra. Uh, it has one histidine, which is in contact with the ferrous ion, and this is, we'll call this the proximal histidine. And there's another histidine, which is a little further away, not in direct contact with iron, but very close. And we're going to call that the distal histidine. In addition, there are two other amino acids present. One is phenylalanine, and the other is valine. Both are very hydrophobic amino acids. Hemoglobin, on the other hand, is composed of four chains. And typically, in humans, this is going to be two alphas and two beta subunits. When we take a look at it, it looks like more like a dimer of an alpha-beta pair plus another alpha-beta pair coming together and form hemoglobin. Rather than thinking of it as two alphas together, two betas together, you come in. So there's more contact between the alpha and beta than there is between the alpha and alpha and the beta and beta. And this becomes important for its function. It has four heme groups, one for each subunit. It has four iron molecules, one for each subunit. Now I'd like to talk about the heme groups themselves. And maybe we can have the first slide. Here's a representation of the heme group, which contains the four nitrogens connected to a ring of carbons. And you can see the iron just sitting in the center. And this is the proximal histidine. And this is the distal histidine. Notice that the Nitrogen and histidine is directly connected to the iron, where this does not occur between the nitrogen and the histidine and the uh, iron atom itself. As I said, the porphyrin ring, which you only see a portion thereof, is a series of alternating single double bonds. This gives rise to resonance structure and also gives rise to a flat and rigid plane which holds these nitrogens in a fixed position so they're exactly in the position to occupy four of the six coordinating uh, positions on iron. And these, as you see, the six positions of iron, there's two, four around the center, one below and one above, an octahedral kind of complex. The iron itself, as we said, has six ligand positions on it. So why would we have protein? Why do we need to have the protein present? Why not just have iron running through our blood? And one of the reasons is that iron itself is a very insoluble molecule present as an ion. And the second thing, in, in the blood, it would go immediately to ferric ion, which would not be able to pick up any oxygen. So that won't work. So why not have a solution of iron tied into the porphyrin ring? That certainly would keep it in solution. However, we still have the problem of the iron not being kept in the reduced state or the ferrous state, which is necessary for oxygen binding. The second thing is, if we did this, and experiments have shown that if we have the, the flat plane of the porphyrin ring with the iron in the middle, we put an oxygen inside there, then what happens? Another porphyrin ring sits on top of that, occupying the other side, and then we have oxygen porphyrin ring oxygen, and we end up with a big sort of a Dagwood kind of sandwich in which the oxygen inside there are so buried that they would never come apart. So by having a protein, what it does, it helps, number one, it helps solubilize iron, and number two, it helps keep the porphyrin rings separated from each other because remember there's one iron per subunit, so the subunits will keep the uh, rings apart from each other. In addition, we have the valine and phenylalanine, which is surrounding that. And it's not shown in this picture, but the valine and phenylalanine are sitting there, which allow 
uh, a very hydrophobic pocket. This is important because in the presence of water, if you bring oxygen, this would immediately shift to the ferric and you transfer the electrons. So having a hydrophobic pocket, pocket is also extremely important. And the last thing is it provides us distal histidine. And please notice, if I go from the iron to the oxygen to the oxygen, that's not a straight line, is it? It's a curved line. And we know that when we bend a bond, we weaken it. So by the fact that this histidine up here, which is forming a hydrogen bond with the other oxygen, but it's sitting here, instead of being straight up and down, it's at an angle, which allows a weaker binding, which means we can remove the oxygen. Otherwise, it'll stick on there and never come off. So the next thing we need to talk about is the binding curves. I don't know what's on the next slide. And this is a typical example of this. A binding curve, what we have is the x-axis, we have this PO2. And re just remember that this P does not involve uh, minus log, but actually stands for the partial pressure oxygen. And then on the y-axis, typically, it's going to be the percent saturation. So 100 in the top means it's all the molecule is completely saturated with oxygen. And of course, down here, it is an absence of oxygen. If we look at the curve of myoglobin, and it'll be like this. And it'll come up, and it'll be a simple hyperbolic curve. This is very typical of what we call simple binding, one and one binding together. Whereas if we look at the other curves, we'll represent, in this case, hemoglobin, you'll see that they form an S, or sorry, sigmoidal curve. And this is indicative of what we call positive cooperativity. Now, to come up with a, a term or a, a value for the binding, what we do is very much like pH. Remember, in pH, what you did is you looked at the pH at which it was half titrated, the 50% point. And we said the pH equals the pKa at that point in time. What we do here is take the 50% point and come over and come down and find out what partial pressure that we need to have half saturated. And we call this the P50 or the partial pressure oxygen when it's half saturated. And we use that to characterize and, uh, the binding of the uh, oxygen to whatever molecule we're talking about. So when we also would talk about, we use the terms oxy and deoxy forms. Oxy forms are when the oxygen is bound to the protein, and deoxy forms when it's absent from the form. So what's causing this S-shaped curve, or the sigmoidal, and I said it reverts back to positive cooperativity. I also told you that the, and we'll switch back to the previous slide, that the histidine is connected to the iron directly, just like these bonds. So these are fairly strong bonds. What you don't see is this is histidine is part of an alpha helix underneath. And so in the absence of oxygen, the alpha helix pulls this iron out of the plane of the porphyrin ring. So it's sort of sagging down, if you will. When we put oxygen present, this oxygen is going to pull the iron up towards so we can form this hydrogen bond. When we do this, it's going to pull the iron, which is going to pull the histidine, which is going to pull the alpha helix. So what happens is you get a change in the position of the alpha helix, and we call this a conformational change. Now picture, if you will, four guys sitting very close together in a row. If one guy crosses his legs, the others are going to have to, otherwise it's going to be a fight. Now, if one of the guys in this row decides to cross it the other way, the only way he can do it is if all the others follow suit. So the idea is that if this moves in and out, then this is going to force a conformational change in that subunit, which is going to form and require the other subunits to also water by their conformation, so they make it easier for them to buy oxygen. Hence, we see positive cooperativity. You might want to review that again by going back over the tape, because this is a very complicated phenomenon.
Okay, so now what we want to do is we've talked a little bit about how oxygen affects the curve because oxygen, if we go to the next slide, please. Oxygen, what happens as we add more oxygen? Then the shape of the curve changes. So the affinity starts out low and becomes increasing as we increase the oxygen. So we know oxygen has an effect upon its own affinity, or actually the affinity in the other segments. But there's some other molecules that have it as well. One of these molecules is 2,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid. 2,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid. So as the name implies, it's going to be an acid. And we know that the pKa's of acid are around 5. We have two phosphates there, and we expect that the pKa's of the phosphates to be 2 and 5. So at pH 7, we're going to have at least 3, if not 5, negative charges in that molecule. That's going to be highly negatively charged. So it's not surprising then we find that 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate wants to bind to the center crevice between those four subunits of hemoglobin. And if it's negatively charged, it's going to want positively charged um, components. And these are going to be amino acids of arginine and lysine, which will be positively charged at pH, as well as possibly the N-terminus. So these will all form a very positively charged pocket the negatively charged 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate will go in and bind it and sort of lock it in position, if you will. The position it locks it into is the deoxy form. So the net result of we add 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate to it, we stabilize the deoxy form. Well, if we stabilize the deoxy form, then what's going to happen to the affinity for oxygen? It's going to take more oxygen to saturate, so the affinity is going to decrease. If the affinity is going to decrease, then the binding curve is going to shift to the right. And if the binding curve shifts to the right, then the P50, which is half saturated, will also increase. Sort of a series of dominoes, if you will, step by step. So that's 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate.